It's good to be back with you again as we're now diving into chapter three of First John. I hope it's been a blessing for you to, to go through this book. It was important to me early on in my faith, uh, but it's also a deeply practical book for everyday living right now about what we can have, but also what we are to be and do. But then it's also a deeply theological book, not just keeping us from false teachings, but, but celebrating who Christ is, that who he is is consistent with, with what has been revealed from the beginning of, of, of the Hebrew faith, but also to push back against not just legalism or antinomianism, but also to push back from any, any heresies of what people might say about Christ. Um, so I hope this has been a, a blessing to you. We're going to dive in, and again, we're just jumping in, and jumping around through the chapter, and I, and I wish we could take more time. We just don't have enough weeks, but there's so much here for us. I won't read every word. I'm going to trust that you'll have your phone, your tablet, your Bible open uh, to these scriptures, but we're going to begin 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. We could just rest in that for this whole session. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, but because it's, he, they did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as, yet as what we will be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, just a couple of reminders here. We're not just called children. It's not just a title thrown at us, but a reminder of that's the reality. This is who we are. Look, I come from the Northeast, and family's very important. I have a very close family friend. He's actually my godfather. I stood at my baptism as a Lutheran when I was a, a baby, and he works in the music entertainment a field and he had gone to rent Madison Square Garden, not to rent, but to, to go to Madison Square Garden to uh, to use some of his services for a show there. I won't say what, I don't want to get him in trouble, but he has a very large company known all over the world and trying to get into that particular arena. He met with the MSG people, everything went fine, but then they said, you know, to be on our campus, you're going to need to meet with one other group. And he said, okay, great. And they named the date, the place, and my godfather showed up. And he walked into a room with two very large Italian men. And they had one question for my godfather. Why, why is your company not a union company? Now, in the back of my godfather's mind, he realized, I may be actually talking to a real godfather and they're wanting to know why I'm not unionized. So he used a buzzword that he knew they would love to hear. Well, we're a family-run business, and we we really have our whole family doing, you know, just as the godfather has his family. He's just trying to hold on to that term to get out of that meeting, not just alive, but to get the contract. And they let him get the contract. Family. That's who we are because of Jesus Christ. Not not just this great salvation of being saved and atoned for and cleansed, but these relational terms we're seeing throughout, this reality of who we are now, you are now. We are the very family of God. You can't miss the relational terms throughout John's gospel, this, this oneness we can have with God, and now these titles, children, family. There is no room in scripture for creating room between you and God. There's no keeping God at arm's length. This is not a legalism. This is not a, a hoop jumping faith. This is up close. God wants to be up close. You're his children. You are his family. You believe that? Now he does talk more and we're going to see more and more about the world. Uh, they can't know who we are, because again, they, they don't know God, so don't be frustrated by that, and we'll talk about that more in, in just a minute, um, but they, they, they um, uh, for this reason, the world does not know us, because it doesn't know him, and again, that's a big buzzword, we talked about that last session, that word know, what that really means, not just intellectual sent to a truth, 
but also they're not in right relationship with him. So how could they recognize who we are? And then this talk of when he appears. We said last week that every New Testament book but one mentions the second coming of Christ. So it should be something that we are versed in, even though there's mystery, but but a, but a truth that we should always celebrate because it's mentioned more uh, than certainly Christmas. Uh, this huge event, more than an ascension, more than uh, the incarnation in some sense, even uh, this reality that Christ shall uh, return. Now, again, there's mystery to that, that when he returns, we'll be like him, flesh and soul back together. Sure. But is there even this talk of deepening of this glorification? Not only are we are we justified, saved from sin, and now being sanctified, made into his likeness, but now being glorified, not as him, but like him, uh, a deep gift. You would think just getting in would be enough. It's not enough for God. I'm calling you throughout this epistle through my servant John, by my Holy Spirit, to live my life. I want you to live my life. And when, when glory is revealed, when my son returns, you will be not him, but you will be like him. I want you to enjoy what he enjoys. And you see that, that, that playing out again, this practicing then of, of righteousness. Not only will you see him, you'll just see him just as he is. What a great scripture, by the way. Uh, you'll see him just like he is. We'll see. And again, Jesus had those issues in John's gospel, everybody wanting to see miracles so they'll believe. But what a great encouragement to the church. One day we will see. And look, we have that hope. Now, you got to fix your hope on him, but also in that coming reality that Christ will return. You put your hope in him. Not only is there to be a confidence, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. But that really should produce in us a confidence, an assurance that should change us. There's a point in the in the films and i can't remember it's been 10 plus years since i've read the books um not just for the first time so i i love those books but in return of the king by um in peter jackson's film of, of tolkien's book this little hobbit says to gandalf the wise um you know he's worried about a battle that's about to happen and, and i love um what Gandalf does, he pictures of what's to come. I'll let you go back and watch that part, but just of, of what the picture will be at the end. Meaning, hey, when, when we do cross over, here's, here's what that life will be. Glistening shores, white sands. And he's just giving a heavenly picture. And, and little Pippin, who's been scared out of his mind, says, that's not so bad, is it? And the next scene, you've got him fighting this courage that's bubbled up inside of him because what's promised, that hope and hope changes things. Fix your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on that reality, and it should change how we live today. It should give us a hope and a confidence to be about what we ought to be about. But it's not just that. Looking at verse 3, there should be a purifying that comes through that. Again, pushing back to those isms, no antinomianism, no anti-law. Because I have that hope, I better live differently. I have to live differently. This should purify me. Uh, not just hope for a future, but this grace of God doesn't rest. Because I have that hope, it should change my heart and my life. And he then says something again about Christ to us. And again, this pushes back uh, on, on all these other thoughts about him. We not only purify ourselves, but we purify, purify ourselves just as he is pure. Now, again, that connecting us to his purity is a radical thought, uh, but that's what we can have. That's what he desires for us to have, not just to be covered from sin, but to have his life. But it does say, again, this radical pushback to those who might think you can think that the God's sin no, Jesus is pure. Or to those who have shrunk back, everything we've said about Jesus is just as it was from the beginning. Uh, his life was pure. So why are you shrinking back to formalism, legalism, uh, uh, Judaism? Don't go back to the synagogue. Stay with us because everything you're seeing in Christ is consistent with what was said throughout the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. 
He is pure. Um, so anyway, there are two pushbacks there as well. This deeply theological book as well as very practical. And then throughout, and I'm not going to read every verse, then you see 1 John uh, chapter 3, 4 through 12, talk about the practice of righteousness. How does this spill out, this, this practicing? And listen, he goes in to talk again, 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 that sin is lawlessness. And he puts it in those categories, which is, again, a good pushback. It matters what we think. It matters what we say. It matters what we do. Don't think, well, we're under grace, so we can do whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, if you are in Christ, as Paul would say to the Romans, how, we gotta, we have to quit sinning. How can it be that we would continue uh, in sin? And verse 5 says, and you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus die? We looked at that. Why the cross? Why the resurrection? And we think, yes, it is to cover our sin, to atone for sin. Yes. But one of the many reasons for why he came was to take away sin, to defeat the works of the devil. You see that echoed here. You're going to see it in verse 8 as well. Uh, uh, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. He might destroy the works of the devil. So he didn't just die so that death may die. He didn't just die that sin would be defeated, but to be defeated now, that you and I can live a life that's pleasing. And you'll see that word here in this chapter, pleasing to God now with our obedience. And I think we just kind of think, no, no, no. I know the pull of my flesh, the pull of the world, the pull of the devil. It's just so tough. I know, just but God's bigger than that. The blood of the lamb is more pure than that and more powerful than that. The, the strength of the spirit is bigger than that and stronger than that. You and I can live the life we're called to live. If we trust and rest in his strength and his provision, um, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, not just someday, but today. And there's really no middle room, room here about this practice of sin. Now, again, I want to be very careful. Yes, no middle room, just like Revelation 3.16. You know, you, you're, no, you're not of any use to me if you're lukewarm. you got to be hot or cold or I'll, I'll spit you out. You're practicing sin. You're of the practices of the devil. You're, you're born of God. It should be different. Now, now, listen, this doesn't mean that there's some kind of perfectionism also that creeps in, that once I've got this grace that uh, everything's perfect. Verse 9, you know, you read that, no one who is born of God practices sin. doesn't mean we don't ever fall into sin, but the habitual practice of sin, that's a no-no in a believer's life. We're not to live there. Um, we still have free moral agency. We can still, God's so good to gift us that. Uh, some would argue we don't really have that when we come to faith, that we're predestined to come in, but afterwards, some would argue we, we, we also are held in by that, the will of God, the sovereign will of God, and there's room for debate on that. But we would say, just because you still have will after salvation, doesn't mean you have to sin. Greater is he that's in you that's in the world. And we should not, should not sin. But this is also not some pie in the sky perfectionism either. Okay, it, it, it understands the reality of that, but the habitual sin, that's got to go. It's got to go. And he kind of gives us a twofold test here in these last verses of through that section, verse 12, this twofold test. If you want to know if, if you're of, of God, it's, it's love God through living the commandments. That's the obedient, the, the Old Testament way of, of saying, saying that I love God is I, I keep the commandments. But also verse 10, you got to love your brother. He's going to bring up Cain. I would even go before that to Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, in the way that they immediately, when sin enters the world, they, there's blame, and Adam begins to blame blame Eve. There's already dissension in human relationships, and you see it drastically in Cain's life. Uh, so this reminder, again, that uh, you just can't keep the commandments, but keep the fullness of the commandments mean we love each other well. We love, it, we love God from the heart. We keep his commandments. We love each other in the heart, and we and we live well uh, with each other. So we talked about that in sermon. It's not just some personal righteousness where I, I think pure thoughts or I, I don't lie, I don't bear fault, but I, but I also live rightly with other people. 
Uh, we can't miss that relational. If we're right relationship with God, it's got to spill out into our relationships with others. And then these last verses in, in John 3, talking more again, again about the world. You don't be surprised, starting with verse 13. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Matter of fact, if, the, if you don't have issues in the world, you might need to check yourself. If you don't have non-Christians pushing back or thinking you're foolish in some way, you need to check yourself because maybe, and maybe it's in an effort to reach the world. I understand that. Sometimes we almost compromise because we're so desperate as Paul reached the world and understood the world, but he didn't compromise things to reach the world. So if, if, if nobody hates you, you might need to check yourself on that. And again, it's not just the devil that hates you, or it's not just, I want to be careful here, the world will, will push on you. If you've passed from death into life, uh, that's going to happen. And um, so, so don't marvel at that. I kind of did when I, when I first became a believer, and I've shared this before, I'll be quick, but I, I kind of was, I kind of was liked. And again, I was desperate to be liked is partly why I, I uh, compromised a lot to get the love of my friends. That was a, a critical need in my life or a want in my life. But once I was accepted by Christ, I didn't have to say those things anymore, do those things anymore, because I had the hope fixed in me. I finally had peace, a part of my life that was a hole that C.S. Lewis talks about was filled by Christ. And uh, so when I became a Christian and all things became new, a lot of my friends did not like the new me. And I took it on the chin and I couldn't understand it. And then as I began to read the New Testament, that first year of year of being saved, and I thought, oh, I get it. If they don't know God, well, of course. If, 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 if I've changed, well, of course the world's going to push back on that. So do not marvel. Now, I will say this. Sadly, because of our social media posts or the way we're so judgmental or the way we can sometimes even be weird as Christians, the world's going to push back. And that's not them hating. That's because of your own behavior. So you want to be careful that there's nothing that should be named among you. It's not fitting according to the saints. That's another passage. But just be careful that they're not hating on you. We'll see the world's bullying me. No, it's just because you're, you're being a bull in a china shop for Jesus. You be careful. There's nothing in your life that would give the world reason to push back against you, other than you have put on the, the, the patience of God, the love of God, the truth of God, and you've done it with gentleness and reverence. But don't marvel at that. And by the way, when he immediately begins to talk, this is such like a pastor. Uh, John, ministering to these churches, says, yes, the world's going to hate you, but verse 14, God's going to give you more assurance. It's assurance after assurance after assurance. Uh, he's going to tell them uh, through this, we know that we have passed out of death. We can know it. You can know it that you're his when you're getting bullied by the world. When you're in this time of struggle and many are shrinking back, you can know that you've passed out of death uh, into uh, life. And you can partly know that if you'll skip down to verse 19, you can know this because we are of the truth, right? And he's just said, you got to live in deed and truth. So even in some sense, you can know by the way you're living, you can know because you're right doctrine and you're in the truth. And then you skip down to verse 21. And beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have this confidence before God. So there's just so many ways in which you and I can be fully assured. Wesley, who actually believed you could fall from grace, talked more about the doctrine of assurance than any other doctrine that he discussed. It's one of my struggles with some of our Bible Belt theology and, and modern theology is that we can't really know we are so hyper to say that, yes, we're a sinner in need of grace, and we, we, but then after salvation, you really, they would even continue to say you can't know by your works, because you could fake them. You can't know by an experience, because maybe the devil has come, as you read in some writings, to mock you with an experience, or maybe even God in one particular uh, writer a couple hundred years ago, that God sends a spirit to mock you to show you what you could have had and pulls that from you. So don't trust experience, don't trust your life. Even maybe even your doctrine, maybe that's the only way you can know. And John says, 
boy, look at all these things. God wants you to know. You can know that you know that you know. We said that last week, but you see it just saturating uh, this chapter three. What a great gift and a pastoral gift. I want you to know. And, and, and listen, it's just like Paul. Paul said the same kind of things in chapter 8, 13, and 14. Who are the children of God? Who are the sons of God? Those who are led by the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you, if you're being led by him, if you're following, if you're being obedient, hey, you're his child. I want you to know that. The next verse, his spirit will testify to your spirit that you're, you can trust that the spirit will speak to you. Now, we always want to check those things. Yes, I agree with that. Check scripture for that experience. Make sure it's of God. Check scripture. Check with Christian brothers and sisters. Make sure your obedience or what you're seeking as an experience. I've had some great conversations with people recently where they had a deeply spiritual experience. And it was such a big kind of experience that it needed checking. But as we searched the scriptures together, we said that, that seems to be of God. Take it as a great gift that you experience that because it's everything that God says he will do. He did. And it's none of the stuff that were considered on the outs. You want to check it, but also be blessed by that assurance. God wants you to know that you can know. Doesn't want us paranoid. As we said last week, he loves me. He loves me not. And then lastly, to, to, to close out this section, section, we get this reminder again about love and love. This kind of love is not of this world. We, we do these commandments. They're pleasing in a sight. You can know that. And this is his commandment. You believe these is just like John's gospel. I've written these things that you might believe. So here he is being consistent again, verse 23. And these, this is his commandment that you believe in the name of the son of his son, Jesus Christ, and you love one another just as he has commanded us. We, we, we sometimes sell the gospel short. <laughs> It's not just about belief. And again, this is more than intellectual ascent to a truth, but this is, I've put my whole faith and trust in him. I believe him, but also it's got to change how we love. I love my brothers and sisters. Well, boy, there's something so right. You're seeing it in this epistle about doctrinal purity. Stay true to his word. Stay true to what is orthodox and, and right belief. It's one of the ways in which we please and honor and glorify God is with our minds and purity of doctrine. That's the warning here. Part of this letter is written kind of as a sermon to say, don't fall for false teachings, but also love God through how you love others. And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And we know that by this, he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And again, another reminder of what we have in him but also, it's not just about right belief. It's about right relationships and right love for others. I hope this is a good word uh, for you, that we're open to the Spirit's work in our lives, that we're open to His life being lived through our life. Maybe it's we're, been a hard season, and, and we need to just fix our hope on the truth that He is coming. And when He comes, He's going to not only let us see Him, but we're going to be like Him. Maybe it's a word of of, of not settling in this session. I've just kind of settled. I'm saved, but no. He wants to live his life through you. And he's given his provision for that. You can abide in him and rest in him and hear this call, keep his commandments, and to, to share and to gift his love uh, to the church. Or maybe you just need to hear again that you're, you're one of his children you're his family, and you've been keeping him at arm's length. And he says, I don't want life like that. Yes, I came to destroy the works of the devil. You ought to live holy before me, but I want you with me. You're mine. How do you need to hear and respond to that? Let's pray about that. Father, we thank you for this, your word. There's so much more here that we could cover, but we thank you for the good word here. And what, whatever we've lifted up tonight, we pray it would not come back to you void, but the Father, you would bless our response, whatever we need to hear, to enjoy whatever we need to enjoy, to repent of whatever we need to repent of, to be about whatever we need to be about. Bless now our response to this, your word. It is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll be back again uh, together for the next session.
looking at 1 John 4. I hope we can get through that whole chapter. Again, if there are questions you have or comments, we need to talk more. I'd love to get coffee with you, meet with you on Zoom or in person. Barry, B-A-R-R-Y at madisonumc.org. Uh,